Um, good afternoon to those of you joining us from the East Coast and good evening to those of you joining us from South Africa, including our speaker, Lengiwe Dube, who is dialing in from the Pansy Museum in Durban, South Africa, where as you can see, she is surrounded by beautiful Nguni beadwork. How are you doing, Klengi? Thank you for having me in this wonderful program, The Beats That Speaks. I'm so grateful to be with part of the program. I am greeting you sitting at the Pansu Museum in Durban, surrounded with beautiful beadwork from all corners of Africa. I'm so blessed. Wonderful. Um, my, my name is James Green and I am the, the Francis and Benjamin Benenson Foundation Assistant Curator of African Art at the Yale University Art Gallery. And we are also joined by Roxana Filpowska, who is the Wirtle Study Programs and Outreach Manager, who is at the um, Wirtle Center in West Haven. How's it going, Roxana? Hi, everyone. Thank you, James. Thank you, Klangi Wei. I am seated in an object study classroom at the Wirtle Study Center. And the next time that you're going to see me, you're actually not going to see my face, but you will be looking through a very powerful document camera at fantastic examples of South African beadwork. And so please know that this is a very visual program. This is a wonderful time to turn up the screen brightness. Uh, when you will also see the beadwork, you'll actually get a chance to either focus on high resolution photographs created by one of our very talented photographers, Al Harding, or the document camera image. So you'll see a bar in the middle of your screen and you'll get to uh, shift it. You'll get to toggle it back and forth to either maximize the high resolution photographs or to maximize the document camera. So this is actually a great time to switch from a smartphone device to potentially switch to an iPad or a computer screen because we will be looking at high resolution photographs and also document camera live handling. I'll hand it back over to James. Thank you. So thank you. I, I just want to um, firstly um, welcome everyone um, um, and just thank you for, uh, for joining this very special program which as you know celebrates the gallery's recent acquisition of an important collection of beadwork from southern eastern Africa. As a South African and one who's always loved beadwork, this program is especially meaningful to me and I'm so grateful to my colleagues at the gallery who have worked so hard to put this together. Thank you especially to our programs team and to our director Stephanie Wells for her support. Thank you also to Michael Stevenson of the Stevenson Gallery in South Africa and to his team for everything you've done to make this possible, including shipping the collection during a global pandemic. Um, through digital programs of this kind, we are really seeking to push the boundaries of what is possible with this new technology at our disposal. So um, please be patient with us as we switch between PowerPoint and camera. Um, this is somewhat new and so a bit experimental. My sincere hope, however, is that even though the beadwork is now physically in New Haven, this collection nonetheless offers us the opportunity to forge connections with experts like Heng Hengiwe, and by so doing, come to better understand these important works of art. By so generously sharing her knowledge with us, we can begin to hear the beads speak, for as Hengiwe will demonstrate, in Guni women encode an entire language in beadwork, messages that are intensely personal and often relating to matters of the heart. So in what remains of the next hour, the plan is for me to say a few introductory comments to just give a bit of historical background. And then we'll move to the close looking session with Flengi and Roxana before closing with a 15 minute Q&A session. Please feel free to type in any questions you might have um, in the Q&A box and we'll address these at the end. In a funny sort of way, I think that what you'll discover is that this is almost a more intimate way of looking at beadwork. Um, and you'll actually be able to get closer to the beads than you would in a museum display. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. So we won't have a chance to discuss every work in the collection, but I wanted to just give you a sense of something of the variety before we begin. Um, there are 96 pieces in total. Um, each piece was selected primarily for its, its graphic strength, 
by Michael Graham Stewart, working with Michael Stevenson through the 1980s and 1990s, um, acquiring works at various provincial auctions in the, in the UK. These works were made by Nguni women in the late 19th and early 20th century using glass beads of various sizes manufactured in Europe. These have been employed as an artist's raw material, stitched onto leather as seen on the left or basketry as seen on the right or onto cotton cloth in some examples or rolled around straw. Glass beads were also woven in such a way as to create a fabric in their own right. Um, dating from around 1850 to around 1910, the collection was made during what is considered the golden age of beadwork, a period when a massive influx of glass beads from Europe inspired a generation of female artists to develop new techniques and innovative designs. So to the left here, you see an Mfengu cape, and this what it would have once been worn draped around the shoulders. And today, especially presented like this, is, is like a painting in beads. The clusters of beads arranged seemingly to play off the negative space of the leather creates a map that really challenges the viewer to imagine the original significance of the placement, the patterns and the colors, meanings that might have always been private to the maker and her closest family. To the right, we have um, a bridal veil probably by a Hlubi artist dating from the late 19th century. It's just an extraordinary piece. Notice how the addition of a single white bead at the center of the triangle adds this layer of dimensionality. Tengi, I wish we could look at every single piece in the collection together. Um, but what are your thoughts on what you've seen so far? Um, first of all, your collection is wonderful. It's amazing. Thank you for allowing me to also view the whole collection. Looking at the pattern and the style and the colors, you can easily identify which part of South Africa the bead will come from. As you mentioned, the cape on the left, which is Mfengu, with the colors, it's when you can also tell that it's a Fengu group. And then the next one, it's a very good example of the Shubi group, which is an apron worn by a married woman, which is Isipa Kelo. Congratulations on the collection. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Um, can we go to the next uh, slide, please? So the collection includes some, some highlights, such as a, a number of, of bags from different regions that reveal wildly different tastes in color and patterning. And within these broader regional styles, the creativity of the individual artist. Um, the collection powerfully teaches us that there's no such thing as Zulu or Koza or Sutu or Indibele beadwork, but really the work of individual women drawing on their own imaginations and sources of inspiration, but within these regional stylistic conventions. Um, Lengi, can you tell us a little something about these? Bags. Yes, um, these bags, they both play the same role. They are all both tobacco bags, which the women or the male can use to carry the tobacco. But you can easily see that they're from different areas. But mm. you're looking at the sequence of the beads and then you see the stitches that has been used. It's make it unique for each group. So it's it's uh, it's stitches that it shows that where it's come from and also the actual technique that has been used where it's come from and the combination of the colors. So the like the first one on the left, which is in Fengu, mm. uh, mm -hmm. and then the other one that's come from uh, South Soto. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? So um, just to give you a little bit of, of background um, before, we, before we get started, um, beadwork has been incorporated um, by people in this region of Africa into articles of dress and adornment since at least the 16th century when traders from present, based in present day Mozambique, um, you can see on the map the region around Maputo, um, Portuguese traders first began trading with communities to the south, um, now known as Nguni. Glass beads were considered beautiful and rare and were readily combined with indigenously produced materials. The necklace on the right is, is a good example of this. It is constructed from these large um, red beads, which are actually called white hearts because they have a white core. Um, and these were made 
on the island of Murano near Venice. And they've been combined here with pieces of bone in the form of leopard claws. So the ownership of, of glass beads um, was closely linked with money and power. Beads were money and the ownership of them was power. Um, recent and more nuanced interpretations of the early history of the Zulu people suggest that it was really King Shaka's control over international and regional trade routes, which allowed for the transformation of the Zulu peoples into a major regional power and so for the birth of the Zulu kingdom. There are clear accounts that throughout Shaka's reign, all trade goods entering the Zulu kingdom were controlled by the king, including goods coming for, from Portuguese sources in Mozambique to the north, as well as from the small number of English traders who had settled in Durban to the south in 1824. Shaka dominated regional trade to such a degree that a growing number of ethnic groups to the north and south were forced to pay tribute to the Zulu peoples. Along with livestock, items of tribute included precious materials that could be incorporated into Zulu dress, such as blue monkey skins and crane feathers. What, um, what beadwork thus conveyed was proximity to the king and to the court, and over time, a language developed around color and, and pattern, which as Cheng Giwe will demonstrate, um, is, sophisticated, is as sophisticated as any um, other kind of language. So, for example, um, we know that necklaces made from lion claws were the exclusive property of royalty, whereas necklaces such as this one, which are made of bone imitations of leopard claws, were worn by high-ranking aristocrats. Um, large red beads were specifically reserved for the Nguni elite. So a great deal of information was conveyed by these items of dress and adornment. Shengi, you mentioned that the Zulu royal family um, actually had the first choice of the brightest colored beads. Yes, like, like in, in KwaZulu, we all like have different sequences of beads, but I found that most of the bright colors like the red, the blue and the yellow are normally were found in the north of Zululand, in Wangoma and Ulundi, where the royal families is. It like, seems like they had a choice of selecting the first bright colors before it goes to the other people. Wow. So then those colors become associated with the, with the court. It, it, it's become known as they are color coding in the area, like the Nongoma and Ulundi area. Wonderful. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. So um, in 1828, King Shaka's half brother Dingani seized the throne in a well-organized coup. And from this moment on, you can see Dingani on the left here. Um, from this moment on, beads were imported into the Zulu kingdom in an increasingly vast number, especially from the newly formed colony of Natal to the south. And the royal monopoly over the control of beadwork gradually broke down. The intrinsic desirability of the glass bead, as well as the ease with which a relatively large number could be transported as cargo, made them an essential item of trade. As these beads became an ever more popular commodity, the island of Murano, located about one mile north of Venice, Italy, developed into the global capital of glass bead manufacture. Even by 1606, there were 251 bead making firms recorded in Murano alone, and Venetian glass makers are thought to have made some 100,000 different varieties of bead types and designs for global export. This card that you see on the right gives a sense of some of the bead types produced by one manufacturer alone in 1899. And note the red beads, um, which have a white core, which we've just seen on that necklace, um, known colloquially as, as white hearts. You'll see these throughout the presentation. And interestingly, the manufacture of these beads was actually halted in the 1930s by the Italian government because they contained traces of gold um, so when you see these, these beads in beadwork, you have a good sense that they likely come from before the 1930s. So moving to the, to the next slide. Um, today, we really have the opportunity to learn from one of the world's foremost experts in beadwork. So Tlangi, thank you again for joining us. Um, thank you for having me in your program. Um, 
I know that you wanted to begin your presentation with these two images. Can you tell us why? First, I would like to talk about the collar. The collar is associated with power, device, protection, and respect. Different group in the Southern Africa has its own style of beading collar with their own design technique and colors. Looking at these two icons, the late Judge Jude and Nelson Mandela, uh, the former president of South Africa, it reminds me of the role that the welling of the collar plays. They were both wise and powerful. Wonderful. And so we actually have a collar that's very similar to the one um, worn by Nelson Mandela um, in the collection. Um, and what we're going to do now is move to the, to the next slide. Um, so this is the collar here. Um, Tengi, just looking at this picture, what can we, what can we say about, about this, this collar? Um, looking at the picture, as I've said, like the beadwork of the Southern Africa, it's differ on it's differ on each group. The way that they put the sequence of colors, mm. and uh, the color that you've seen on the screen, it belongs to Mfingo group, which are the subgroup of the crosses. The Fingo group don't talk with individual colors, but it's the combination of the colors of beads, the style. It's identified the group and the status of the owner of the necklace. The size of the necklace also guides us who have been worn that necklace. Definitely by looking at the size and then that one is for the male. Right. So if you now, if everyone looks on the right hand side of their screen, um, we're, we're, we're going live with, with Roxana, um, who is filming the actual piece. And Roxana, I was wondering if we could look at the, at the back of the necklace. So Lengi, when we, when we were looking at this together, you mentioned that some of these have a little leather strip at the back in order to give some support. Can you just talk about how, how this necklace is constructed? Because the, the, the actual stitch that has been used uh, on making the collar, especially for the finger group, it's called a maketango, which is a chain. It's an overlapping stitch that make it very heavy. It's doubling the stitch. So it's give the actual necklace a weight. So other pieces will find a strip of leather at the back, which will be attached on the collar of the necklace just to, con to carry the necklace so that it doesn't fall apart because of the weight of the necklace itself. So that leather piece, as we know, that the Fengu and the other groups of the Kosa people, they always attach some few letters on their pieces and collars. It's one of the pieces that you can also find a, a stripe of leather inside as a form of like holding the necklace. And mm. they would stitch mm -hmm. it like on the first rows of the collar of the beads. Mm. And Roxana, just as you're holding it, what does it what does it feel like in your in your hand? Well, the beads are very cold and the collar is quite heavy. I would say if I were to put it around my neck, uh, it's about five to seven pounds of these cold beads. And so I would imagine that I would actually have to roll my shoulder blades down my back and really elongate my spine. So uh, this collar would absolutely uh, invite its wearer to have a very straight posture. Hmm. And um, so maybe we can get a little closer to the to the stitch to this um, this double stitch. Wow. So Tlengi, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the about the stitch and how it was how it was. As I've mentioned that like most of the groups uh, in the Southern Africa were make the collars as a lace uh, stitch, but this one it's doubled. So the first row will have been used the stitch called umtlontlo. We as the Zulu people don't double the stitch, but this one it's doubled. So you go on the first row going left and then when you come back, you're still going on the same row that you went through as you were going to the left. Mm. It's like repeating the stitch on top of the other one, overlapping it. That's why it's so heavy. And as part of your own um, practice, you've been recording different stitches, correct? 
Yes, uh, I've noticed that lots of uh, stitches has been forgotten. So I'm trying to reveal it because I've noticed that there were like few stitches that are practicing these days. And then most of them, the people, they don't know about it at all. Mm -hmm. And you, you've actually made a collar like this yourself. Yes, in fact, I've made the similar collar, trying to bring back that stitch so that maybe in the future I can be able to share with the new generation so that it won't be forgotten. Mm. And just looking at it closely like this, you can see all these different blues. There's a very dark blue and then a medium blue and then this, this turquoise color where you have even variations within the, the turquoise. What do, what do the blues mean? Um, first of all, in order to understand the color, you have to understand the actual people, the language that they talk. Like on this sequence of beads, like the way that they lay out the colors, it shows that they are the finger group, but the actual meaning of the color, it refer on the Nguni name. Like for example, the dark blue, which is called Inkankane in Zulu, it's mm. a bird. So whenever you hear that sound of a bird fly, you feel like you can have the same ability of the bird and fly wherever you want to go. Maybe you're missing someone that you want to see, and then you feel like if you have that that wings and fly to the doorstop of the person and pick up the, the seeds. Wow. And then you have like the medium blue, mm. which is, uh, yeah, that's called one, they call it Inkambu. So it's one of the blues that you find mostly in this area that they that recognized with. And then you had the light blue, which is representing Ubluandle, which is a sea. So that, that shows that it's always like a sea breeze. Whenever you, you feel or think of someone that you love, you have, feel like you can have the same uh, breathe and breathe the sea that will be fresh and then and pure. Wow. And then it's finished off with these larger black beads at the bottom. Yes, which is a uh, tear top beads. And mm -hmm. then sometimes they would put like a seed beads, okay. uh, which is red reddish. So it depends which beads that they have in the arrow. But it's also help to control the weight of the beads as an agent. Right. Thank you. So I think we should move on to the next group of necklaces, um, the, the Zulu necklaces. We could, um, yeah, so this, um, this is just an image that I took on my iPhone of this, this collection of rolled necklaces. Um, and you can see that they were formally stitched onto this blue fabric and put in a frame. Um, and these were once part of the Africa Bank um, collection in Johannesburg. So um, the, the beadwork's just arrived and our amazing conservation team is carefully um, unstitching um, each necklace. But, Thank you. Before we really delve into the meaning of these, um, could you just tell us all a little bit about how you how you learnt the language of Zulu beadwork? Uh, I'm from Develop a Thousand Hills. My family has been practicing uh, traditions, and my grandmother was a best beader. And then we he started collecting and sell it to the museum, and that's where I had an opportunity to meet. Professor Frank Jollis and Dr. Mangosu Tibutelezi, where we share the messages of beads and how, what sort of mess, uh, information you have to answer to the owner of the piece in order to understand the meaning of the beads. And then I was able to travel mountain and hills to visit the communities and get it from the mouth uh, of, of the people who actually make the beads to understand the language because like our language although we are zulu speakers but we speak different the people from the other side of Tugera river would speak differ from the people on the other side of Tugera. so our languages are not the same meaning mm -hmm. that the beadwork messages also from the beadwork that come from north of zululand will differ from the beadwork that come from the midlands like mm -hmm. msinga area or develop a thousand hills like the people of this Southern Africa developed a form of symbolism in their beadwork in colors, as well as the color combination and patterns, particularly in beadwork, which were made as a love token. Mm. So just looking at this group here, some are longer, some are, are shorter. Who, who would have worn these and how, how, would, they have been, how would they have been worn? Um, there are names that are given on each size of the necklace. The short one, they will call it umgingo, which is a short size of a necklace that can be worn as a necklace 
or as a headgear. And then you get the medium size, which they call it umbijo, and then they use it as a necklace. And then the longer size, they call it invagane, and then that one can be worn as a necklace and also as a waist belt. But these necklaces are worn by both male and female, regardless of the age group. So um, we are now going to, to really focus in on, on one necklace. And Roxana actually has it there in the Wirtle Center. Um, you can see it there on the screen. So um, Roxana, shall we, shall we zoom in? There we go, wow. Um, so, Lengi, looking, looking at this, um, can, you, can you tell us what you see here? What, what message can you, can you read? Okay, this necklace, is, in fact, is quite fascinating. When, when I first look at this necklace, I said like, wow, it's got that light yellow in that yeah. I repeated yeah. many times. And then I look at the actual sequence of the beading, the way that they've put it. Remember that the beadwork has the negative and messages and positive messages. And then like the light yellow in Zulu, we call it in Chaga, which is read as, I am so sore at the heart because of the manner in which you spread our private affair to the public. So already I know that this is a negative piece. So whoever made this piece, it's not happy at all. So this person who made this piece, it's not happy that their private love affair has been spread to the public. And then I've looked like, what's the next size? And then I've seen that there were colors, which is more like a green color. I'm becoming very sick of this thing. So I become so thin because I'm so frustrated about the whole thing that you are talking. And then they've added the pink. Mm -hmm. And what is so galling about this whole thing is that fact that you are discussing this private love affairs of ours in beer drinker. So you're not just like talking to the public, but you also go to the beer drinker at bars. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about our love affairs, which I'm not happy with. And then you see that there is a black on the necklace. It seems quite dark to me. I cannot see my way through these difficulties. So I'm not sure whether we'll go through with these difficulties. I really so I'm so furious. That's why they added that red, that red which is Umli Luana. It's, it, it's a fire. So I am so furious about everything that is going on here. And then out of all that, they've put the blue, the turquoise mm. at the edge. Although we are passing all these difficulties and then you, you keep on talking to the other people about our love affairs, but I still have hope that you change one day. It's the same like the weather changed. Wow. One day it's sunny, the following day it's rainy. Same day you get three weather. Unbelievable. So and then like you look at this necklace, you said, oh, okay. Mm. So this necklace was made for people who are already in love, it might be that maybe they are engaged or married. Wow, that's it's, it's completely mind opening. And so let's 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 go into the to the um, to the end of the to the necklace to the clasp there. Um, okay, the 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 edge of the necklace. You see, mm -hmm. there, there are two bigger beads next to the loop below right. the button, that beads, it's given a special name, it's called umgalaza. It's also got the same color as the colors that you see repeated on the necklace, which is a yellowish color, which representing um, intaga for someone who's not happy about everything. But that size of beads, you can also found it made like on the maternity apron that is mm -hmm. made for okay. a women, or also you find it on, on some pieces, which is specially worn by women. And just looking at it like this, um, you can you can get a better sense of its structure. How how is this actually made? First of all, the name Ginga means rolling. The name is referred to the method by which they are made, wrapping the string of beads around the cloth of fiber call to form a long tube. So like you string the beads and then you roll it around the fabric or it, any tube things that you create that necklace. 
Wow. And then at the end, then you sort of like cutting it straight, the edges, and then use as a, they call it a imipeto, where you can like finish it off nicely beads with a stitch instead of rolling. Because if you can roll, everything will fall apart. But you need to have a solid stitch at the edge so that it's all the actual thing. Mm. Roxana, what does it what does it feel like in your in your hand? The yellow beads are very pronounced. They really jut out. And so mm -hmm. I think that even if I didn't see the colors, if I was wearing it, yeah. I would definitely pay primarily, att primarily attention to that negative message of the yellow beads. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, it's yeah. not, you remember that uh, it's not that negative yellow beads, but it's the way the sequence has been put in that's make it a negative message on it. Okay. Yeah. So um, thank you. So let's move to the next slide to the to the love to the love letters. So um, in this case, we are going to have to rely on a on a photograph um, rather than on actually handling the object. Um, as I've mentioned, we are just unpacking this collection now, and some of these are, are quite fragile and in need of conservation, um, including this example here. Um, our plan is to work closely with Klengi in the conservation of these objects. So she will actually guide and teach our conservators using this camera, um, which is quite amazing, the, the wonders of modern technology. So Klengi, just looking at this image here, um, what, what would this necklace tell us about, what would the sequence of colors and patterns tell us about the, the wearer of this necklace? Okay, first you look at the way that they put the colors together and mm. then looking at the color of the necklace, which has got the, uh, the green as an edge and the color of the necklace, that green, it's a light green, it's representing that I am young. So this necklace, it's belonged to an engaged woman. Sorry, so this is the green around the neck? Yes, that green, it's a light green that says, I'm not young enough not to be chosen. So it means, as I said to you, I love you. So it means that I am ready to become your wife. Wow, so she... And then they've added the pink, which pink in Zulu, they call it isipofu, which refer to poor. So it means in this case, I'm not looking at the wealthy. I'm not looking at what father, at, at your father's kraal, how many cackles you have, but I'm just coming with pure love. I love you, even if I know that you've got nothing. With the hope that one day, you'll be able to marry me. That's why they put that black, which is representing the leather skirt that is worn by a married woman. So she's marrying for love. Yes, like she's wishing to get married and then she's had a hope that the wife, mm. the boyfriend will be able to pay the price of the bride. And then you look at the panel, the actual two panel, which is yeah. Amatema. And it's got rows like lines. It shows this are the walking the path that they'll be taking in their relationship. And then it's had the green, which is a little bit darker to the green that is on the neck collar, the darker yeah. one. That yeah. green, it's a symbol of waiting. Like if you see like looking at the river and then there were always like stones on the side of the river because the water bumps on those stones all the time, they become green, greenish. So oh, that shows wow. that those stones has been there for quite a long time. So this lady, she doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long it should take to put together the price of the bride, but she'll wait because she's got the love. That's why they add that rate as a love. Beautiful. And um, in the image on the left that you wanted us to, to include, I, I noticed that the man is wearing the beadwork necklace and it's combined with these valuable materials like feathers um, that would have been that would have been produced um, locally. Can you tell us anything about the, the necklace? So the, the woman would have made it for the man to wear, is that correct? Yes, the, the necklace would have been made by a woman to a man with a, a message behind. So like if that message, would, if that color would be clear, we'd be able to see the color, but unfortunately it's an old necklace. So it's an old image, you can't see closely with the colors. Great. So I think um, this is a good moment to to move on to the to the to our next and um, final slide. So um, these two extraordinary pieces. Um, so these are two necklaces of the same the same kind. 
Um, but you'll notice subtle um, variations in, in colors and patterns. So building on what you were saying about the love letters, how can um, we interpret the meaning of these? Let's, um, let's begin with the one on, on the left. Uh, first of all, love among the Zulu was a very private nature. You never found a person say, I love you, because love was always kept as a secret. There was a custom among the Zulu maiden of making a beadwork, which would be given to their lover as a token of affection. There was also beadwork that were made or worn by any ordinary people. But uh, the messages in each piece was very personal. It was only be fully understood by the close friend of the family. But also in order to understand the message or the reading of, of the beading, you have to understand the, the group tradition, their customs, their yeah. rivers, yeah. their trees, their language that they speak with, their animals, wild animals or uh, house animals that they have, then you'll be able to understand the language. But the shape also identify the status of the person. Like, for example, the triangle that facing down for unmarried men, and then the triangle that facing up for an unmarried woman, and then the diamond shape for so, married so, women. So the, 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 the triangle you're referring to is, is up at the top there, right? By the class. Uh, the triangle, like like on, on, the, on the first image on the left, there are yeah. two panels, two square panels next to the buttons, which okay. therefore the triangle facing, pointing down, in, in which it shows that this necklace is owned by an unmarried man. Okay. And so then the, you've got. So there's. And then so you've got the our, panel. Our, yeah. And then you've got the panels on the sides, which is called like little squares, which they call it shield. So it okay. means the person who make this necklace, it feels like protected by the lover because shield, you protect yourself when you fight. So it's the, something that you protected from, mm -hmm. from the spear or anything. So if someone made something and then put those, they call it a, a shield of shaka. So shield. it's more <laughs> like a, a symbol of protection. Okay, and then moving down to the central panel here with these three central diamond formations those uh the the long the necklace itself although it's a love letter but it's given a special name called ulimi etang because of the size of the necklace so mm -hmm. the actual panel it's it's got more white on it and then it's got a little bit of dots of, mm -hmm. of different colors, and then it's got that, those diamond things. It means that the person who actually made this necklace is wishing to get married to the loved one in the future because it's, it's got those signs. But the strong uh, designs that pointed that it's for an unmarried man is the top one on the collar. And then you find like there are colors that are also there, which they have like the red, and then which is shows that uh, if we get married, I will be bringing a living car. So I'll be wearing a red hat with representing the number of kids that I'll be making in your house. So it means whatever price that you paid. So they put that pinky as a price of the bride. So whatever price of the, of the bride you paid the ilobolo, I will return it by bringing more kids in your family. Beautiful. So um, now we're actually the, we're actually going to look at the one on the right in in real life with Roxana. So um, if you look to your to your screen um, on the right now, um, we've got this this overall shot. Um, so let's let's um, let's move into the to the panel at the front and and really talk about this this stitch. The necklace itself yeah. is made out of untlamvunye, which we call it in an English name, brick stitch. It's brick. more like, yeah, it's more like making a house. You put the bricks in different layers and then not straight up, but in between. So it's how the actual structure of building has been, that's applied on the making of that necklace. And then the size of the necklace. Mm. That necklace is called Itemba, which is a love letter. 
And then this necklace itself, it's worn by a married man. Why am I saying it's for the married man? You remember I talked about the shape, the triangles and stuff. Mm, so yeah. if you look at that necklace, the long panel at the center, it's mm. got some triangle facing down and some other triangle facing up yeah. because yeah. the the sign that shows a married man at the face at a triangle facing or meeting at the center. So those pointing triangle, it's guide mm. me to see this necklace belong to the man. Wow. And what about the strip of turquoise running right down the center there? The 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 actual uh they call it ink ambu which is uh, one of the special neck, uh, colors that you find on the people. So on this one, he are saying that uh, so you're more like a sea sand, the way that I feel when I'm with you. And then they mm -hmm. close it with black. And then if you notice on those uh, triangle in, uh, on the sides of the turquoise, the black and the red. Mm -hmm. The black and red repeated it's called invalinvali, meaning closed. So it means this wife, it's not a joke. The person who made this necklace, it's not playing jokes. So she doesn't want a second wife to join. So it's closed. It's called mm. invalinvali. Mm. So she put this triangle to say, I am married to this man, but also closed. So I don't want anyone to join us in this love affair. And I noticed there are little pink beads in the black on yes. the either side of the panel. Yes, the pink in this setting, because it's more like dots. The dotting of right. beads is representing a fruitfulness. It can be a children, it can be the cactus, it can be a newborn of a child, or maybe anything that is new or good. And then in this case, because it's on this man's necklace, which is mm. on top of the black, which is uh, representing the married woman. So this man saying, I'm happy that you paid enough price of the bride to me. So it's representing the tattoo. Mm. And just going up to the clasp, um, there seems to be a little area of beadwork that looks that looks different from the, from the rest of the necklace. Yeah. Yes, if, if you look at that uh, close look at mm. the beading next yeah. to the yeah. loop, yes. It's the same stitch that is used on the first love letter called Oku. So this is an extent of the love that they have. So they're still like remembering where they come from because mm. those are the actual colors that talk, that got that message. And then they apply the same colors to the whole necklace. But that Utu is the first necklace that uh, the love token that has been given to the boy before they get married. Because now they are married, so they are like communicating with different messages. Wow, so, that, so that's the original pattern that was on the first love letter. On the first love letter called Utu. And so in this necklace, you're actually seeing the expression of an entire relationship. Yes. yes. And, and the feeling, like how the, the, the woman feels about the love that they have. Mm. Roxana, the, the base um, of the panel, um, do you think we could look at that and just look at that brick stitch? And I was wondering if you could tell us what it, what it feels like in your, in your hands. It, piece is, uh, it feels impenetrable. <laughs> the mm. beads are so tightly uh, connected. I'll just show you that there is a double, a double of these red beads. Oh, uh, yeah. So you can really see it's like a wall. I mean, it's a brick stitch. But, but the, the, yes, the edging of the stitch, it's called ameva, which is a thorn. It's more like umpeto of everything. It's a trimming of the beading. So it's double the beading. It's not the same stitch that has been used on the body of the necklace. Hmm. Right. Well, I think that now is a good moment to... Um, to move to our, to our Q and A session, so um, if anyone has any questions, um, please make sure to to um, add them into the chat. Um, we have one here. Um, 
someone asks, um, I would love to know more about, this is Ellen Cleary, and she says, I'd love to know more about um, Miss Dubé's hat. Oh, the, the hats that I'm wearing, it's belong yeah. to the Pondo group. It's belong to the Pondo group of the Eastern Cape, which are also uh, the subgroup of the courses. Hmm. Thank you. And then um, someone asks, um, when, when would a woman have, have, have learned to bead? Um, uh, there is a, a custom among the Zulu where the young lady, the young maiden will learn from the old lady of the community, the Amatigiza, where they will share how to combine the colors and how to uh, talk with the beads, how to pass the message on. And then when, um, when would a woman have, have made her first love letter? Um, Sometimes it, it depends, like if you first fallen in love and then the Ikigiza, which is a leader of the girls, is the one in fact who will take the love token to the, to the lover. So it means you will have to report it to your Ikigiza when you're ready to be taken. So it means if the man proposed to you, the first person that you will know that you are ready is the leader of the girls. Okay. And then would a girl be taught to bead from her mother or grandmother or? It's, it, it's more like a passing to the woman to woman. So it's all started at home. Like I've learned from my grandmother how to bead. Mm. And then like I've shared with my daughter. So it's more like sometimes home things. But when you reach a stage where you want to pass messages, you have to communicate with the elderly lady of the community because you can talk with your family about your private love affairs, but mm. this person will guide you and also give you the guidance. If you reach this stage, how you be behave, you're no longer a young girl. So you have to change the way that you behave and the way that you dress so that people can see that you are already been chosen. Mm. So I've got a question here from Norwood Creech. Um, how, how long would it take to make a collar like the one that we see here on the, on the left? Um, the, this, because it's a brick stitch and then you pick one bead at a time, it can yeah. take maybe a week. And it's also depend on the hours that you spend on the necklace. Like if you work overnight, you're talking like 24 hours working on the piece. I'm the fastest beater. I don't know people, they always say that for me to, it can take me like three to four days to make it because it's a very tight stitch. Well, um, and um, so we have a question from, from Robert Galloway. Um, and he wants to know if you, if you consider this, this art form to be a, a living tradition in, in South Africa today. It's dying, in fact. It's very sad that it's dying. These days, you can hardly recognize where the people are coming from because they're no longer dressing on their color coding, but they're just copying each other. Sometimes you find like me, for example, I'm a bad example today. I'm wearing the Pondo hats, but I'm a Zulu. <laughs> so that's how it, it's very difficult now to keep it because we go with style. Right. So would you say, um, would you say that there are more kind of national fashions developing rather than local yeah. styles? Definitely, I can say that, but there are some other areas which they really still sticking on their traditional customs and stuff. Looking at the Valley of a Thousand Hills, people are still wearing their traditional outfit. You can easily recognize the stages or the stage of the person, the way that they dressed on special ceremonies. And also on my area where I'm original from in New Hanover, in Great Town, down in Guamapumulo and Voti, people are still wearing the, their colors. They are recognized with their outfit. But other people, they're still just copying each other. Mm. Um. But it's still, I, I mean, people now, instead of using glass beads, they use plastic beads. And there is, I mean, beadwork still has a meaning in, in modern day South Africa. Uh, beadwork, I, I think these days they just put more beads. It, it, it's fact, sometimes it's shocking when you see a young lady wearing a colors that you say, I'll never touch it if I'm a young lady because they don't have understanding the color uh, sequence. But these right. days with the, with the beads that have been produced in China, which is also grass beads, they are 
slowly bringing back the grass beads, using of the grass beads rather than the plastic beads. So mm. although it's heavy, but they come up with a, a way of making like necklaces that can be more fashionable. And then they can also be worn on the wedding ceremonies. I was just glad these days that they are bringing back the colors, which they now you can see them on special ceremonies, wearing it on, on weddings. And then they attach like tassels that's hanging down. It's, it's, it's such amazing that some other people, they are revealing all those uh, mm. traditional mm -hmm. designs and the, the wearing of it. And in certain church groups as well, no, like the, the Shembe group. Um, isn't there a lot of beadwork that's worn? With, with... The the Shembe book, uh, the Shembe Church, which is the Nazareth mm. Church, it's uh, they're still wearing the beadwork, and then the way that they put beads, also you can easily identify the stage of the person, like whether it's a married woman or it's a young maiden. So the beadwork of the Shembes also stands out because, like they have a specific necklace or a specific apron for each group. So you'll never find a young girl wearing a piece that's belong to a married woman. Mm. And also, if you look at the Shembe people, there is a necklace, which is also a collar necklace, which is, has been given to the married woman to wear on their special dancing ceremonies, because that collar is representing the, prote the protection, the status, that they're holding for their families as a protecting of their families. Remember, we talk about the collar as a symbol of protection. Yes. And then in yes. the church, then they're giving this power to married women because those are the ones who are the pillars of the families. Okay. So we're getting lots of questions about um, how these pieces age over time. Um, does the thread weaken or fray with time? Um, how, how can they be preserved? Um, it's, it's very hard. Like if, if, if it's made out of fiber, it's very hard to join it with a cotton and you can't get fiber these days that can be pulled from the tree to bead with. But if you find that you've got a necklace that is coming apart, made mm. out of fiber, mm. just pull the edge, try to get the tip of the fiber and then maybe apply a little bit of a clear nail polish just to stop bits from coming out okay then yeah. because like there is no way that you can repair it by putting the needle through that because the whole of the beads will be very tight to repair it hmm. thank you that's very helpful um so we're getting lots of questions here um so someone asks, um, would, are, so are the men able to, to read the bead messages? Sometimes you receive the love letter and then you'll be able, you can't read the message. And then you have to find a way of going to speak to someone who's close to your girlfriend to, in order to understand the message. Because remember, the love message is very personal. But yes. once you understand the, the designs, you understand the style, you understand the colors, it's easier because there are common colors that are used, especially like the white for purity, for virginity. And then you know that the red for love, for marriage, the living hearts, uh, heads, which is, um, is a color representing that. So there are some common colors that you have known the meaning of it but the sequence it's what twists you more because like the way that they put together the colors it's where you have to get the message from the person who actually made the piece okay and we have a related um question here from from matt noiseau who asks um if the knowledge of the 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 um the colors and the the symbols is something that comes from the from a family not at all like my, I, my grandmother share a lot of uh, information with me but i also get the message getting the information direct from the people who actually made the beadwork the people who actually won the beads so i've been to across kwazulu natal 
down the hills, crossing the rivers, and I've met different people. And I had an opportunity to meet uh, in the Msinga area. I've met the lady who was Klupeki Lezuma. She was, had so much knowledge. And then mm -hmm. I had an interview with him and uh, with her, we, together with Professor Frank Jollis, where we will be able, well, was able to understand more the sequence of the beats of Msinga. And then I was able to see that there is a difference between the Msinga beads and the north of KwaZulu Natal beadwork communication with the Kalis. Wonderful. And just so everyone knows, we're, we're sharing an article by um, Lengwiwe and, and Frank Jollis that focuses on Msinga um, beadwork. So, so we're going to send a, a, a group of resources that you can, that you can look into. Um, I, I've got a, there's a really great, great question here from Simpiwe Butulezi, um, who says, how can Nguni beadwork be reinvented and preserved by the younger generation of artists? I am a contemporary artist that works with references of Zulu beadwork. How can we preserve the integrity of the practice? Um... It's, it's a very hard thing. In fact, I've started something by myself. I've started, it's been a, a year and a half now where I went through the books. I went through the museum. Luckily, I had this Pansy Museum, which they have a diversity of all this antique beadwork and other traditional uh, household pieces. So I examined the pieces. And then now I'm in a process where I'm beading, I'm rebuilding. It's more like revealing all these stitches that has been forgotten because I don't want it to die. I call it, it's a missing stitch that people, they don't see. I don't know how that we can share with the other people so that they can understand our stitches and then keep it. Because otherwise, if we don't do that, who else mm. would do it? Because like we are here, the young people that come behind us, they don't know much about the beadwork. We as still understanding the little bit about the beadwork, we are the, it's our responsibility that we keep this uh, treasury alive. And that's why the, the record you're creating of all the different stitches is so important. Yes. Um, so this is a message from, um, Casey Malincrot, who says, hi, Lenguile, wonderful to see you. Um, how much have beaded, have, uh, beaded pieces changed over time, either to repair or to edit the message? How is that decided? Um, like th these days they don't, um, as I've said, like these days they don't make necklace to pass the message, but they just make necklace to look nice. Like even like if you go to special ceremonies, they not they don't have that specific necklace that you can say this is for the bride, this is for the groom, but they're just like wearing the beads. So it's not much that has been saved on that. Well, I just love that with the last necklace we were looking at how there's this sense of of the message building over time, um, beginning with the love letter and then then growing into this into this this broader necklace. Um, so, so are pieces of beadwork, are they reused ever or will the beads be taken apart and turned into something else? Could you use your gran reuse your grandmother's beads? It, it, it's quite amazing because like the first piece that I've made when I yeah. was 12 years, I always say I've fallen in love with beads when I was 12. And then the mm. first piece that I've made, I stole my grandmother's beads and I've made the first love letter which I took to show Joe Top, the founder of the African Art Center. And then mm. that piece is housed at the Kili Campbell Museum. So I was so fortunate. So it means that you can take some old beads and restructure it. But there was a story where we traveled out to the communities and then we were asking them because I was trying like to collect all this antique before they get died and have exhibition where I would invite the museums and galleries to have the option to select the pieces for their collection. And then we put the word out that we are looking some old beadwork. You won't believe what's happened. The ladies, they take apart all the beads and then they brought us loose beads. And then they said, that's what we thought you want. And it's what, like, I had some tears because I was like thinking of 
all this beauty that disappeared because the actual people didn't understand that we were looking for the finished product, not the loose beads. Because wow. what they're doing these days, they were taking apart the beads and redo something. And then they thought that maybe we also want the loose beads so that we, we can do something else. They didn't wow. understand that we actually want the original pieces that they were wearing. Huh. So they do have this this life and this this sense of being re, reused over, yes, over. Yes, yes, yes. So I think we have time for one last question, and um, there's a question that's come in from from Carol Nell, who just wants you to to touch on the brass button that's that's added to the to the end of the necklace. Um, where would the brass buttons have have come from? Maybe storage. I don't know. I don't want to lie about that one. I don't have an idea where the brass buttons come from, but you're looking at the old beadwork. Most of them, they've got brass buttons, especially in the Eastern Cape, they also got brass buttons because mm. the Eastern Cape, they've got a different name, which they call beads. They call it in Zimbi, which refer to iron. So because like most of their beadwork also had some little bit of iron. So I'm not sure exactly where the button come from. Mm. Well, we are on, uh, it's 1.30 now, so we have reached the, um, the end of, of our, um, our session here. Um, and I just want to thank everyone who's, who's joined us today. Um, you will have to just imagine that we are all in a room together and that you could come up and actually speak to all of us, um, to myself, to Roxana, to Hlengi, and ask questions. I know we didn't manage to get through everyone's um, questions, but um, do, feel free to contact um, all of us through the gallery. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll be sending a list of resources in the chat, um, including Klengi's biography, um, in case this has spurred your interest and you want to learn more. Um, Roxana? Thank you, Klengi Wei. It's been such a pleasure to learn from you. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I very much look forward to the prospect of hosting you at the Wordle Study Center. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, James. It was a great pleasure to be the part of this program. Thank you so much. Good evening. Wonderful. Thank you. So I, yes, I hope you'll all come and see the collection in person and also visit our African galleries, which have been partially reinstalled um, and now have a wonderful display of rock art. So goodbye and thank you. <laughs>